one, happy holidays to everybody and uh, to all of you that I know there's many of you in this room that are, are uh, either supporting uh, this very important mission, either directly or indirectly, or have maybe served at one point in time. And, uh, and thank you, Megan, for the introductions. I, I want to start, I, I just, I can't resist doing this public service announcement and, and first and foremost, and this is not about coming into federal service, I'll save that to later. Uh, this is about one of the things that the chief said, you know, when there's many people in this room that have been out to the border, right? I'm not talking about the ports, I'm talking about the border patrol stations. And more importantly, I'm talking about in between the border patrol stations. And when you go out there and you talk to the leadership and you ask them what they need, every single time, without a doubt, every single one of them will tell you the number one thing they want is to make sure that when those officers go around that hill, they've got communications with each other and back to the mothership. And what's one of the first things you heard the former Border Patrol chief and the current one say, and we're still talking about this, so I would just sort of call us, uh, call to arms here to all of us to burn that into our minds that we have to solve that problem. We've got to do it in some affordable way. We're going to talk a little bit about some technologies that might be breakthrough there. But I just want to point that out. All right, so uh, we will sprinkle in questions throughout. If you've got a burning one, raise your hand. We'll, we'll fire away. We're not going to wait till the end to do that. And I will budget some time to do that. I think it's very important that you all... Um, have an opportunity to ask a series of questions. We kind of went up and down the value chain. We're going to kind of come down a little bit, but I want to start with some basics and make sure that everyone has a good understanding in this platform. And that's for both uh, Renard, you and Jeremy to one, describe what your organization is, sort of what it's responsible for. And then we'll have sort of a, a 1.5 question, which is really about, okay, in that context, what's the process for you all to sort of examine technology and, and test technology, you know, whatever it is you're doing in these two organizations? So, Renard, let's start with you. Okay, so uh, first off, thanks again for having us. I uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with the industry. I don't get the opportunity very often, considering the uh, scope and scale of things we're working on in Border Patrol at the Program Management Office. But first, before I get to what we do in the Program Office, I want to let you know it's a team sport up at the headquarters, right? So it's not just my office as a directorate. We have our law enforcement operations directorate. We have a strategic planning and analysis directorate and our mission support directorate as well. And those folks are dedicated to ensuring that we have a tight, tight requirements management process. From the requirement itself, to the execution in my shop, to the PPBA process, to uh, disposition of systems, and then and redo it all again. So. Uh, hats off to the to leadership at the headquarters for the things that they do to support what we're able to deliver out of my shop uh, with respect to the technologies. So now onto my shop, which is a, a team of, you know, three to 400 people with respect to all the contractors that are supporting us as well. Uh, we are focused on uh, tower technologies. We have subterranean technologies. We have command and control and communication, focus on radio, video, voice and data and how we do that better. Of course, you hear some more of that from, from, from Jeremy and CBP Invent. Uh, we also have our, our mobile technologies and, and, then, and then, of course, infrastructure, which you heard about a, a little bit ago. So we have a, a group that are dedicated uh, program office managers, uh, program managers, program and project uh, supervisors, logistics, systems engineers, uh, real estate and environmental specialists. Just it runs the gamut in terms of the skill sets. That are required to get the things done that we are we are doing for, for Border Patrol. So that's kind of the scope. Uh, so this fiscal year, just, just to mention that we were able to execute between June and the end of the fiscal year $200 million worth of technologies uh, for Border Patrol agents in the field. From SUAS, we're going to get another 167 of those units out in the field. But what I want to highlight there is our focus on what we realized there is no Jiffy Lube for SUAS when we started down this path, right? So. We needed to figure out how we focus on commodities going forward in terms of that and, and send them out there with a few spare parts. Once they're broke, we get rid of them and buy another. So that's 80%. 20% would be hybrid, long endurance, high battery, long battery life, uh, fixed wing, vertical lift and takeoff, the kinds of things that are for you know specialized mission sets there. 
Uh, we've also uh, distributed 175 out of 200, excuse me, 195 out of 277 ASTs. The most towers in a long, long time that have ever, ever been deployed in terms of uh, uh, our ability to get those on a very small, small footprint. Um, so that's a huge win uh, for Border Patrol in terms of the uh, autonomous world. We've also, uh, we're also looking at linear ground detection systems. Uh, we've got 140 miles out there today and we just got approved to do another 500 on top of that. So that's gonna be key. When you look at that strand and those 20, uh, those 20 strands inside that fiber, we're gonna use a couple for sensing and comms, and that's gonna be a real big game changer, I think, once we start to, to move that data uh, across the border in a big way. So this is just some highlights for you in terms of what we're focused on, how our, how our office is structured, um, and then we can get into some of the other questions as we go along. I appreciate that, Jeremy. Same question. So what does the office do and then we'll get a little bit deeper into sort of how you do it, and, 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 uh, but let's just talk about what the breadth of the responsibility of the office is, and maybe a little bit of how you two interact with each other. Sure, right? sure, sure. No, I appreciate that, <clears throat> and please bear with me. I'm a little bit hoarse today. Um, so first and foremost, it's super humbling to be here uh, amongst colleagues and, and leaders and former leaders, um, people that have recently retired. It's, it's, uh, I've seen some faces that I haven't seen in a while. So uh, again, super humbling to be here. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so the CBP Innovation Team is located in the, in the Office of the Commissioner within CBP. Um, I, had a, I had a supervisor at one time that, that told me that if you can't put your job on a bumper sticker, then you really don't understand what it is that you do. So this is the bumper sticker for my team. Uh, there is a little bit of buzzword bingo, so, so bear with me. But our, our team identifies, adapts, and delivers disruptive, commercially available technologies uh, to, to maximize mission impact, right? So what, so what does that mean? Um, First and foremost, the decisions that my team make, uh, principally the things that we do, they have to make the frontline personnel safer and more effective. Um, I know it's been brought up a couple times this morning, but it's a solemn reminder that we lost a Border Patrol agent yesterday, and we lost an AMO agent to gunfire a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> so those are the types of things that, that motivate the decision-making processes uh, on, on our team, and it's a, it's a constant reminder. I make it a constant reminder to our team uh, some of them aren't law enforcement officers like, like, like I am. I'm, I'm a 20-year Border Patrol agent uh, by, by day. Um, so that's very important. Um, and this next bullet is important as well. Absolute focus on integrating solutions in the CBP enterprise. And since industry is here, I'll, I'll emphasize the word integrating. Um, probably more to, more to talk about there, but that's really, really important that we're able to do meaningful integrations and not um, you know, continue to have uh, stovepiped proprietary you know, that, that doesn't help. That, that doesn't help. This panel is about tech convergence. Uh, being able to converge technology requires meaningful integration. Um, our, our mandate is speed. Uh, we want to deploy something in, a, in an operationally relevant, you know, pilot quantity in zero to 18 months. Um, we, we think by government standards, that's a pretty, that's a pretty quick turnaround to, to get something in the hands of, of an end user. Um, and then lastly, we, we are not um, program owners. Um, that's, that's more uh, Mr. Singleton's job, that he owns the, the acquisition programs of record. We will bring in you know, innovation projects and, and you know, try to uh, turn it into something, tweak some knobs to meet a mission need, and ultimately transition it out to a, uh, a program of record or, or a new business owner. And there's obviously there's more behind that as well, but um, that's ultimately our goal. So there's a, you know, a, a few core elements, I would say, to the, to the let's call it the CBP invent model. And it always starts for me with a, with a customer and a problem, right? So we, we often talk about, you know, for the, for the requirements process, you know, operational requirements and those things mean something within the, the acquisition framework. For my team, it's, it's much more often about, you know, we, we have conversations with leadership, the entire spectrum of CBP down to, to you know, frontline personnel. We, we talked to them about what are, the, what are the wicked problems that are absolutely stealing your lunch and what are the urgent compelling mission needs? Because... That's where innovation resides, I would, I would argue. I'm not saying you can't innovate in other areas, but as it relates to our limited, our limited manpower and, and, and the problems that they're encountering, those are the things that we wanna focus our innovation efforts on. Um, and then it becomes, it, it becomes pro, you know, sourcing that problem. What do, we, what do we wanna do with it? And so over the course of three or four years, we've established relationships with um, a few different mechanisms, you know, one with the, with the intelligence community, one with the DOD, and then we obviously have our internal stuff within DHS. Uh, you know, science and technology, the Silicon Valley Innovation Program, things that are just organically available to us as, um, as members of, of, of DHS. And then there's, you know, unique contracting authorities. So there's a lot of different ways we can source these things. 
um, the different mechanisms that, uh, that I mentioned, each of them are kind of good at, a, at certain things. And so like we've got a nice, I would say, uh, menu of ways to, to source some of these problems. Um, it always starts with an agreement for me. Uh, one of the biggest problems with, with research and development innovation is the technology pull through. It's easy to start. It's really, really hard to finish and transition it and make it, uh, you know, something lasting and impactful. Um, so we always start with, you know, what we'll call a transition or a customer agreement. And that basically says, you know, we're going to work this together. Um, and as part of that agreement, I'm going to fund a uh, you know, limited scope pilot deployment of, of a thing. We're going to iteratively develop it. Um, if it goes well, I'll pay for a low rate initial production or some type of modest expansion. And if that goes well, I'm going to pay for two years of bridge ONS so you can get this into your budgetary cycles and you can pay for it yourself. And <clears throat> I would argue that's the piece that, that's, that's missing in a, in a lot of, you know, um, this, this type of circle. I was innovation R&D, right? So um, trying to help them bridge that, that value of death. Huge, huge deal. Um, and then again, I think the, 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 bread and, the bread and butter of what my team does is this iterative capability development. We'll, we will get a capability in-house via whatever mechanism it is, develop a statement of work, and then start, start working with that, that company um, to, to get to that end state. And then again, uh, we want to transition out. Um, if you just indulge me a couple more a couple more seconds, I'll be done with my intro. I don't want to suck all the air up in the room here. Um, That's okay because I already got three questions. So what is so what is that so what does that mean? Um, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, we work with VC backed startups, um, and there's there's a reason for that. Um, I looked it up yesterday in, prep, in in preparation for the panel, but in, in 2021, just in the United States alone, there was 333 billion dollars of venture capital fund. Um, invested in, in the United States, the most ever, more than twice the year before that. Um, there's a little bit of a, of a downturn here in 2022, but it, it, uh, it's forecast to still be around $200 billion worth of investment in 2022, which still, even though it's on a downtrend, would make it the second you know, largest amount um, in history. So we would be foolish to not kind of draft off that, that dynamic, right? So estimates go anywhere from 14 to 1 to 18 to 1, every one of my government dollars to a VC dollar, right? So we're, we're able to leverage a significant amount of investment um, in, in the startup community. Um, focus areas, should I, should I keep going or do you want to? <laughs> well, why, why, why don't you hold for just a minute? I'm going to hold for and, and a second. Megan, I need a breath I'm anyway. I'm going to ask you to make mm -hmm. sure that uh, somebody gives us a 10-minute warning. So I, I just kind of know that because I, I, I can see us kind of getting on a roll here. Um, I guess for clarity for the audience, one is, uh, Renard, I, I guess you, you're really focused on the Border Patrol portfolio, right? And you're focused on all of the mission sets inside of CBP, correct? That's correct. So, so Okay, yeah. just want to make sure I had that right, just so everyone kind of understands that. Number one. Number two, I guess for you is, um, how, how does that, since we kind of got into 1.5, how does that handoff or that relationship work between what you're doing while you're sort of bringing this thing out of the Petri dish, getting it to a point where it could potentially be operationalized, and then where, what's that relationship with um, Renard's organization? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, and it, it's, uh, it, it differs depending on the component and the, and the type of relationship. It just so happens that the, the relationship that we have with the Border Patrol is incredibly strong. Um, and in fact, you know, the linkages go back to, you know, when, when the team was set up in 2018, yep, it was, I, it was, you know, I recall. it right. was, it was, it was Border Patrol driven at the time. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm thankful to say that like, we've been able to expand to, you know, um, you know, the, the vast reaches of CBP, which is, which is awesome. And there's, uh, you know, as everyone here knows, the mission space that the CBP covers is, is crazy, crazy diverse. Um, but <clears throat> we've got actually got an MOU that we just formalized. Uh, within the last couple months, where uh, Mr. Singleton and, and, and our shop, you know, have a have a more uh, let's say formalized agreement that uh, you know thing, things will come in and we we will work as a you know kind of a, a tech pipeline on, on certain things um, and the things that work um, and there's there's a whole conversation that can be had about you know uh, risk acceptance and, and and some of the calculus that mm -hmm. goes into those decision processes. Not everything is is a success, right? But the things that do work and do add value to the mission. Um, we've got we've got a pipeline here, and there's kind of a you know an expectation that when we come to him with something, um, it's it's at a certain state of, of readiness. Um, so I, I think it was, you know the chief mentioned earlier, like I don't I don't need another thing or, um, so yeah, right. It's at a state of readiness. It's something that was a uh, 
a, a problem set that was brought in from the uh, from the operators, and you now got it to a point where you've sort of shaken it down. I, I'm trying to anticipate some of these questions. What about the priorities, right? You, you've got you got Air Marine, you got field operations, you got Border Patrol, uh, lots of different technologies, all kinds of problem sets. H how do you rack and stack that? Who makes those decisions? Um, again, it kind of depends. But it, it depends on the component, and then I it see also the smiles. Over yeah, there. yeah. No, no. There's, there's well, there's lots of inputs. I there think lots of inputs. <laughs> Lots, I lots of inputs, that, but I mean, just generally, right? We're yeah. trying to understand. No, 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 a lot of it is a lot of it. Can't do it all. So, so I would say, can I, if, if I, if I may, please, please. The sector chiefs, the stations, they, they have a voice here. So we're we're getting the feedback from the agents on the ground. When when we stood up the program management office in Border Patrol back in 2017, we were we were focused on ensuring that Border Patrol agents were in our office a part of our decision-making process, understanding the acquisition lifecycle framework, understanding the acquisition process in terms of how do we connect with the external partners, uh, whether that be S&T, uh, DHS Parm, or any of these other offices that impact our lives with, with respect to how we do these acquisitions. And they're taking that back to the field in a huge way. I think we've, we've had probably over 80 agents coming through our office at this point. Some are now permanent. Uh, and I think that's been huge, huge for us to understand how the operators need to um, uh, respond to the threat that they have and, and, and how to keep them secure and safe. So that's that's a huge, huge part of what goes on in the requirements management process in terms of the Strategic Planning Analysis Directorate, which is also uh, um, connected in a, in a major way with CBP Invent Office in terms of what they go off and experience, experiment with in terms of proofs, proofs of concepts or, or pilots. So I just wanted to make that point as well. Okay, and I'm just gonna bump on that one more time if I can. Sure. Um, Sounds sounds great. I'm I'm Mr. Port Director, and I'm really looking for that uh, uh, you know version three license plate reader uh, that I was promised a year ago. So so how does that happen as far as between the different operational entities? Is it you know who has the highest priority requirement? You know, and and, and again, who sets that priority? Who's got the money? Yep. He's got the great idea, all of the above. Yep, fair question. So yeah, again to the to the point of <clears throat> lots of lots of input. Sometimes it is, you know, it's it's a conversation that we have with with Mr. Miller and it's this is a this is a thing that you, that we need to focus on. And, and just so they know Mr. Miller is it, Mr. Miller's the acting commissioner, or mm -hmm. it's or it's Mr. Chief Ortiz, or it's, you know, another another executive assistant commissioner or whatever. So we, we try to have um it's 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 less frequent than I would like, but we try to at least you know two to four times a year sit down with each each of the agency heads for each of of, of the components of CBP, and have the question you know in, in addition to these are the things that we're working on for you, but what are again what are the wicked problems? What's keeping you up at night? What can we try to help you with? Um, and and we get feedback that way. We also do an annual um, just for one of the for one of the mechanisms that we work with. It is it is a you know foundational principle. Once a year, we need a problem set, right? So. Can't solve a problem unless you know what you're what you're focused on. So mm -hmm. that's the first piece for us every year. We have a running list. These are the these are the you know the urgent and compelling mission needs that we have for CBP. Um, so in a way, those are you know those have been prioritized, and that's a bottom that's a bottom up process, right? We we send that out and we get feedback from every, well the entire agency from right. from the top to the bottom, right? Um, and then if if I'm being completely honest, in, in terms of, of of innovation, sometimes it's entirely driven on an operational environment, right? Like if I need to do something that involves a maritime environment, there's a short list of places I can go. Um, and we also try to we also try to establish relationships in the field uh, that we'll call innovation hubs that will that will work with us and act as you know our our uh, our counterparts in the field to help with this innovation journey. So we have end users you know, participating in the data collection, participating in the testing events, um, you know, facilitating field visits with companies uh, so they can get out and they can see the operational environments because that's super important too. Um, you know, it, it's much easier to solve the problem if you can see it and smell it and taste it than it, than it is to hear about it, right? So um, that's, that's another core principle. Um, and then, you know, back to the prioritization piece, each, each component kind of has their own um, their their own apparatus of how they how they you know will adjudicate those decisions and we try to insert ourselves where, where we need so the, you know the appropriate governance is there the the, the appropriate um, folks know about the things that we're doing but it's it's often you know because it is a limited scope pilot sometimes we need to go we need to go where a certain condition exists to do the innovation to do the pilot um, but we we also try to pair that up with you know 
uh, where, where are you hurting? If, if there's a way that we can be, you know, e economical with the innovation effort with, you know, uh, an operational requirement or need of something bad that's going on, then, then we'll, we try to do that as well. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, uh, we're, now, we're gonna start with you first on this one, um, and then we're gonna kind of break it out into the, our industry experts here because there's no question that they're um, doing a lot of this type of stuff. And when I'm talking about stuff, I'm talking about sort of wearables, right? The individual on the ground, whether in a warehouse or on an X, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And let's just talk about, you know, where, where are we on the conversions of this technology uh, you know, sort of onto the belt, onto the officer, and sort of rationalizing some of that. Are we stacking more on it? Is the belt getting heavy? Is it getting more simple? What's the uh, sort of demand signal coming in from the officers? Two, two answers for you on that. So one, um, many of you in this room have commented on our Consolidated Tower and Surveillance Equipment, uh, RFP and do certainly appreciate um, you all doing that. I think that's a stronger RFP as a result. Hopefully we'll get it out here fairly, fairly soon. Um, but I want to flag in that request for proposal is an associate contract uh, agreement clause. Uh, and so that's going to be like the first time we have, you know, this clause in a contract that says, hey, look, we want you to work with other vendors. I. I meet with a lot of you, uh, and I love the, the meetings we have, and I learn, and I ask you how, we're do, how we look as an organization, and I do appreciate the feedback, and I want to keep, keep doing that. Problem is, I'm only meeting with one of you. I'm only meeting with one company, or your, you and your sub, and I need to be able to sit in a room with more of you who are providing this capability to us. So that's one answer uh, to the question with respect to how are we going to integrate these, these systems together. So that's, that's, that's one. Uh, so the second is the work that uh, uh, Sunil talked about, where we're taking small bites at this apple, not trying to boil the ocean. We don't believe there's a unicorn solution for, for all of these things being integrated. And we have to take small steps and take certain sensors to figure out how we can make this work. So I'm not IT and no one in my office is IT. We can, we're pretty smart folks, but we can, you know, we can break things if we're not careful. And so we want IT, you know, IT in, in, in the, on the team with us working hard. And I think the, 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 the strength of, the, of, of our organization right now is um, certainly reflected in a lot of the comments you heard from Sunil, uh, our ability to get the teams together and work really, really closely on how we're moving this data. Um, we spent probably a full week there in New Orleans talking about just this uh, topic in terms of the different enforcement zones, excuse me, enforcement systems from University, uh, unified processing, common operating picture, and, and our beacon s solution, tying all these things together. How do we do that carefully? And, and getting off site and having that conversation is, is part of that. So A, I can't, I can't wish you to be working together so I can put it in a contract. <laughs> and B, uh, we're gonna be working with I, our, our IT folks to, to bring it all together. Appreciate that. Uh, let me scan the audience for any questions before I get into the next round here. Scanning, scanning. Here's what. So Jeremy, you mentioned. Uh, Hang on a second. We're going to get a, a microphone over there. Luke, you surprised me. <laughs> Sorry. So Jeremy, you mentioned some of the wicked problems list and the things that you're keeping on. So what are some of the top ones on that list? Oh boy. Um, so some of the some of the themes I think that have already been spoken to um, this morning have come up. You know the ability to communicate <clears throat> as as a border patrol agent. It is it is truly um, it, it is amazing that it's, in this day and age that there are areas right. You know, job one can't can't communicate on a radio. Can't communicate on a phone. Can't communicate. It's it's a, it is a significant officer safety issue. Um, and even so, setting that aside, even even in established areas where there's infrastructure at at, at you know. Ports of entry, where people come and present themselves for entry into the country, there are often places where there's horrible connectivity. Um, uh, you know, to the point where, uh, you know, anecdotally, I've, I've heard. So we're, we're in the process of doing a pilot with uh, with OIT, doing some pure Starlink to locations like this that they could use an enhancement, um, like 20 to 30 minutes to log into your basic enforcement systems in order to do your job. Um, so last mile comms in, in some of those environments, uh, wicked problem. Um, you know, just sit, general situational awareness of, you know, what, what is happening. Um, 
both right now and what are the things that are coming. Like we need to be a little bit more anticipatory and that's that's a wicked problem. In the trade mission, it's, you know, uh, point of origin analysis, you know, I, could, are there things out there that could help us identify that it's, you know, an item has come from a specific region in China where there's forced labor? Uh, that's been a focus the last year. Um, I, I could go on and on. There are problems. There are many. Um, but for a person, us, for a person like a, me, that, that means just opportunity. Just give us an Air so. Marine one, too, since you gave us the other two. Um, so... Top one at Air Marine. Well, for, it's the same thing, right? That I don't, Tom's. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to presume what happened with the shooting a couple weeks ago. But um, you know, situational awareness and understanding where you are in time and space, and and having other people that have guns know where you are. Um, you know, maybe an outcome is different, or I, I don't know. But comms are horrible for those guys. Like you get out on the water, it's the same thing. Unless there's a boat, you know, w within you know direct di direct range of of your. Your land mobile radio, you you can't talk, so um, it would it would not surprise me to to, to yeah I don't want to speculate. Right, um, well, we're going to get into some of this LEO in a minute, but I, I want to. But ask maritime the, domain awareness is a big one too. You're asking about you're asking yeah. about AMO. That's yeah. not even an AMO specific problem. Mm -hmm. NDA is a big deal. Yeah, big big uh, big problem set. Going to ask our industry partners to weigh in here. We have two global superpowers here that. Uh, uh, while they're not uh, VCs, they work with a lot of VCs, and, and a lot of times they, they, they actually end up buying some of these companies. You all have seen, uh, uh, and I know you all have deployed a lot of capabilities, technology, convergence, et cetera, and a lot of different types of uh, form factors, a lot of different use cases. Uh, I'll start with GDIT. Um, just uh, fire away. Sure. Yeah, Luke, uh, thank you. Great point. And when you look at GDIT, we're part of a broader family, the GD company. So... You know, we're also exploring what the GD um, mission systems, GD land systems are doing for uh, similar environments like a, a DOD DIL environment where you're deployed in very quickly into a remote location where you've got to stand up comms where there are no comms. Mm -hmm. You may or may not have satellite availability. So we've started an investment um, where we've got 5G and edge convergence. So you need that edge computing, but, um, you know, as we've heard today from, from the panelists, if you don't have that communications back, it does you no good. So being able to uh, partner with, with Dell, for instance, on this um, and T-Mobile and others to be able to create a solution in a box that now gives you edge compute along with a mesh network capability that you can rapidly deploy, tie into a backhaul. You know, when we look at those solutions, for instance, in a DOD environment, the Army faces similar challenges you know, on a regular basis. Um, Dell, same question. Yeah, uh, first I, I need to uh, just uh, thank everyone um, for the privilege of being here. So a little background, um, Renard and I first started working together when I was on the other side of the fence uh, when I was in Interior. And I was the architect and the director of uh, DOI's uh, Drones for Good program. Yep. And we were attempting to pay it forward. And, and what a great program we have now. And it's just a real privilege to be here. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of the um, contributors to our success in our drone program was leveraging uh, industry from startups to, to the, the big companies like Dell and GDIT. And, and I'm just so privileged to be here now uh, to continue to help. Uh, and, yeah, it's, it's all about uh, teaming. And um, we have uh, we've been teaming with uh, small companies. We have an, an OEM group that's looking for looking at the really small companies and how we can help boost them up uh, and let them play in this world uh, and uh, give them the exposure, uh, as well as with our um, full uh, full scale integrators uh, to uh, to be involved in providing these solutions and and having been an, an operator not only in DOI but uh, in the Navy for a career. I have a, a real sense for what Jeremy is talking about, you know, um, getting it out there, getting it in the hands of the operators so they can uh, try it out and tell us how to make it better. Um, every time I think we turn around, we see Starlink uh, or we see, um, uh, you know, another SpaceX. F9 going up, uh, uh, deploying these satellites. And undoubtedly, at some point, we're going to have a fully meshed environment out there. I mean, I just think that that's, we have to assume that at this point. I think both of you, both of these companies 
uh, are working on ways to leverage that. And I heard that you all had a pilot, which is, sounds promising. Let's talk about that for a minute and just make the assumption, and I think it's a fair one, that that capability is going to be out there and available. What does that do for us? Does that unlock some capability, break through some of these requirements that we just haven't been able to solve? You know, I think as it becomes more available, Luke, and we get uh, more consumption, that'll help drive the cost down. One of the bigger challenges, you know, when you look at this is um, – is also spectrum on the other side mm -hmm. of it. You know, even when we talk about 5G spectrum management, prioritization in some of the remote uh, areas, uh, less of a challenge, but then how do we prioritize to make sure that the, the agent on the border has the right amount of bandwidth available while are there others uh, fighting for that? So I think that's going to be something that continues to involve. Whether we talk about uh, small SAT or 5G, making sure we get that right prioritization on comms, uh, throughout that environment. Um, is it you all that's doing the pilot or is it okay? So tell, Join. okay, tell us a little bit about that pilot. What's yeah. the expectation there? And is there an expectation that you'll scale that if it's successful? Yeah, no, fantastic question. So so the initial the initial pilot that we did with Starlink, uh, when it was just, you know, the access was I think just for the northern latitudes only, you know, we, we did, I think it was a it was a port of entry, Linden, Washington, it may have it may have been, but the the feedback coming out of, that, out of that was really, really positive, and it got, it got our team's kind of creative juices flowing um, as to, you know, not, not only how could we leverage that, but is, would there be other, what other type of architectures might we be able to take the Starlink backbone um, and then cascade some other types of, um, of radios and meshing together to ultimately connect, you know, a Border Patrol agent to his cell phone? Because as everyone, I assume everyone in the room here is, is, is familiar with the fact that on the green side, the way we're trying to give all of our agents it's time. It's time to give our agents one of these things, right? So, I've I've heard that there's more computational power on this than, than NASA had to land on the moon, right? That's there's a lot of untapped, a lot of lot of untapped potential on this phone. Um, so all, all of our agents are going to have the team awareness kit, situational, uh, uh, geospatial, uh, situational awareness, shared situational awareness, right? So I know where I am in time and space. I know where where you know Red is in time and space. I know where. Other things are in time and space. Um, game changer, uh, and it works great when you have cell phone service. It works okay when you don't have cell phone service. So, um, the 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 idea was, you know, I've got an agent, and he's paired to a. Uh, I'll just say the names. He's paired to a, a GoTenna device, and if I have some GoTenna devices at the top of the ridge that act as relays, that can hop out to, you know, we'll make connection to a Silvus radio, and there's a, a box that gets that to the Starlink, and so. In theory, and this is a very, very um, uh, short explanation of the concept, right? But I can, I can, I can insert a data connectivity bubble to an area where there was no comms before, and and things can get in and out. And then there's also interesting things we could do with uh, rotary wing aircraft, for example, uh, with with mesh radios. You know, putting one at a fiber endpoint on existing infrastructure and one on a bird, and now we can get information down from the helo and up from agents on the ground from TAC. You know, we're really starting to, 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 to paint a more cohesive picture um, from, from the air support to the guys on the ground, uh, threats in the environment, so on and so forth. Um, so we've done two demonstrations on this, on this concept. It is a complicated architecture. Um, so there are things that we need to, to fix and fine tune, but this is to your point earlier about how do you collaborate with, with Mr. Singleton. This is a, this is a project that we, we did the initial pilot on. We see enough you know, potential mission impact here um, that we both invested, you know, more money this year to uh, to build out a roadmap to do, you know, a handful of, of additional sectors as we move forward and continue to uh, to troubleshoot and improve and, and and again, like the core concept of my team, iteratively develop this capability. Mm -hmm. um, so, Renard, if I may, um, if, if this technology continues to get mature, sort of starts to uh, unlock a lot of capability. Is there the potential to sort of usurp some of the things that are you already cooking in the program office, or so, or enhance it, or yeah, what so are you absolutely. guys thinking? So, so yeah, you're, yeah, you would all be interested in this, right? Which is uh, what we learned in the AST Autonomous Surveillance Tower project is we, the program management office, needs to be ready to receive this as a program of record. As long as you keep funding it for two years, or we keep funding it for two years, <laughs> so that we can put it in this uh, resource allocation plan and get a decision on that. Um, so we are right now actively building the program of record, which will receive this, what we're calling seamless integrated comms uh, sort, sort of effort that he's working on today. 
Uh, so that program of record is being titled as SAMSON, Secure uh, Advanced Multifunction Operational Network. Uh, the team is building all of the necessary acquisition documents, which, as many of you know, take quite, quite a while to get done and, and, and go through the process. And so we are prepared to uh, focus on voice, video, and data long term in the, this, uh, this program of record we're trying to establish. We don't think that there's a unicorn solution out there, which is why we're looking for uh, these kinds of um, opportunities to, to test and build, test and build. Uh, and then we think once, once that happens and it's, it's gotten the momentum it needs uh, across the different sectors that don't have comms, we'll be able to wrap it into a program of record and continue to build on that. Um, also pointing out the fact that in investing in this is great, but we, and we have to look at the logistics of all of the things we're doing as well. Mm -hmm. So two thirds of our budget is all ONS. It's the maintenance and, and all the things that are associated with keeping these things going. So long after all of the contractors have left and all of the contractor logistics support agreements have expired, we still have to maintain, maintain this equipment. So anything you all can do to help on the logistics side for any of the capabilities you all provide would be great. Just wanted to sneak that in as well. <laughs> That's my five-minute warning. Um, uh, let, let's let's kind of bring it back down. We're going to come out of the LEO. We're going to come back down to the officer. We're going to get right onto his device, his or hers device, and just talk about form factor and simplicity, and how important is that? How are we doing on on that? We heard the chief talk about it. We heard the former chief talk about this. Right, that's always been an issue. Is that getting better? Is it getting worse? Is there a lot of energy being put into that, sort of that officer experience, right, to keep that simple? I'll yes. One of you. Yeah, so I, I will say uh, maybe, maybe we fail sometimes with, with the simplicity piece, but um, again, for, for my team, you know, speaking from, from an innovation perspective, that's why it's so important that we have end users involved. From the from the word go, um, you know, it's you, you'll you'll hear or if you're around CDP long enough, you'll hear a conversation that says something to the extent of you know, the guys at headquarters made, made that decision and didn't talk to the field. Um, that's that's not what we want. You know, my uh, our team will not be branded that way. I'll say, um, so it's of it is of <coughs> crucial importance that we involve the field and the people that actually, you know, experience the problem that are that are living this day in and day out. And have them in the iterative capability development process, so that the the, the feedback that the capability provider is getting is meaningful and, and gets gets to a point where it, it is a thing that is a that is a you know a pleasant user experience. To your to your point, um, Renard, are we answering the mail on this one? I think we are. I think we're getting better. Absolutely. I, I think that until um, we can go to a sector in a C two and, and look at the screens, and there's not five screens with seven different applications running with three keyboards and folks running notes back and forth across the room, then we're, we're in a better place. And I think we're moving that in, in that direction. I think that the, the, the folks in the, in the field and ladies, you know, the, the agents and officers in the field understand that we're focused in that uh, and, and on that journey with them by having IT people at the stations, at the C2SENS, understanding that problem set and bringing it back and integrating it. So we're getting there. We got a ways, to, we have a ways to go, but we're dedicated to getting it done. Questions? There's got to be questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, here we got one. Now we got a second one. We'll start with you, Tom. Stand by, get a microphone. There you go. To all of you, industry can message Congress on your behalf. And if we set up, as you just said, an ongoing dialogue, we can help in the communication because it's difficult enough, as we all know, for you to get funding, especially when 66% of it's going to O&M. That, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't leave a lot for the development for mission delivery. So that would be one thing I'd highly encourage because the funding is going to control how much success we deliver to the operators. So your thoughts on that? I, I'm so going to speak I, for them and say yes, I think please. they will take all the help they can get, yeah. but they can't say that, but I can. All right, we have another question here. Good afternoon. Thanks for your time. Um, I'm going to get the microphone there. Good afternoon. Thanks again for your time today. This is Orlando Carrasco from Lidos. Um, so I, I guess it's a two-part question, uh, especially from the innovation perspective. Can you explain a little more about what is the whole cycle of 
from something that is being piloted or tested. How you find those companies, how do you work with them, you know, how you fund that, or is a, is a somebody coming with their own funding to, to do the, uh, the research? And how does that go all the way to the field? Is that like a, you help find the customers, do they already have one? Do you help with the procurement? You know, how the whole cycle goes into, uh, actually, to the hands of the agents? Yeah, ooh, I may need another 30 minutes to go through this. Um, <laughs> kind of went through it, but maybe just yeah. top line on it again. Um, let, me, let me see if I can, I'll, I'll rewind and I'll, I'll try to hit the wave tops of some of this stuff again. But so again, it you know, usually starts internally for me with, with a customer and a problem. Um, source the problem. So of the mechanisms that we use, a lot of a lot of a lot of the stuff that I get from industry is pushed, right? So one of the mechanisms that we use, they they speak to thousands of companies a year. They have our problem sets. So when they're doing their tech foraging, whoop, there's something that, that might be of interest to CBP. I'm going to send that over to them. But they also do the diligence on the on when the you company. Say they are doing the tech foraging. Who's doing the tech foraging? Um, Who's they? This particular mechanism that supports the intelligence community. Okay, um, I got you. So there's some, mm -hmm. so there's some so rigor that's you tell and those sort of things. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's some rigor that's gone into that recommendation, right? Who, who's on the board? Are there foreign nationals? You know, what's the what's the, the the business health of the company? Those those things mean something to me, right? It's that's different than a than a cold email or referral. Um, so that's that's a that's a large part of it. And then and then it really the business piece really kind of depends on. <laughs> Which there, there's several different paths we can go, right? So if, if I'm going with DHS, then there's you know maybe that's true true startups. You know sometimes it's literally a couple guys doing a thing in their mom's garage in Silicon Valley, right? Um, if it's the likes of Incutel, that's the VC backed startups. If it's something via DIU, that's uh you know um, the the hook there. It's, it's got to be clearly it's got to have a, a a nexus to a DOD mission, um, but they have access to unique contracting authorities. You know the the production and prototype OTA. Um, that's that's often very very helpful. Um, so it's it's sometimes it's the path of least resistance. Sometimes it's you know if if, if a capability is uh, maybe let's say on, on the more the more you know risky end of things, I really like to get a company on a developmental work program where there's payable milestones. So like it helps it helps buy down that 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 financial and programmatic risk, right? You do the thing or you don't get paid. Um, sometimes it's a <clears throat> this this might elicit some groans from the audience, but I like bake offs. I like competition, right? I like I like environments that are going to drive prices down for the government because ultimately, um, you know, I, I'm I'm accountable to our colleagues at the Hill that appropriate and authorize the money with which we do this, which I think was one of your other questions. And you know, there's there's been um, and, and I'm I'm blessed. We are blessed. Uh, you know, CDP. You know, we've had a, a little carve out for innovative technology in our in our appropriations bills that have allowed us to to do this innovation work. Um, so it's generally funded out of, out of that money, um, the, the stuff that my office does at least. Uh, and for those that, that might uh, be talking to the Hill members, uh, I think we want to remind them how important that is and, and, and to uh, continue to support that, that effort. Uh, again, I think I can get away with Is that helpful, that. sir? Yes. Did, I, did I miss any piece of it? Some part of CBP where they yeah, no, that's that's yeah. I'll 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 take it first, and then um, so it, it, again, it depends on the mechanism. Sometimes there's a path to procurement. Sometimes there isn't. We always think with the end in mind. So again, part of part of my part of part of our transition strategy. If I if I come to Mr. Singleton with something at the end of the day, we want to have I want to have a contract with pop and ceiling on it. So all that he needs to do is execute task orders. That's it. Um, so that's the ideal outcome, right? I've, I've, we have matured a capability to a point where it, it meets an urgent, compelling need, and I have a contract with pop and ceiling. Here you go, sir. Um, so that's that's that, that's an ideal transition for me. Um, when we when we get indications early on in this in this kind of I'll call it like an innovation life cycle, whatever that hey this looks good, like this we might have something here. We start having the conversations about. What is what is the what is the right procurement strategy um, to to potentially scale? We have those conversations early, um, so so that we're not we're not in a bad position when, when the time comes. Um, and, and, and or if I may, I mean you heard it just a moment ago. Thank you. 
um, right? You're, you're examining some technology, you're doing some pilots and proof of concepts, it's looking promising. And I think, Renaud, you can, you can speak up here. Uh, hey, I, I think we're at a point where we're getting ready to start cutting a, a program of record here, right. and that's going to start that acquisition cycle. And, and that may take the form of, I don't know, National Defense Authorization Act, Section 880, right? Shark Tank, like, you know, we'll just put a couple of proposals in and we can keep it moving that way. It, it may look like an interagency agreement with DOD because they have access to, to the tech, and, and so we'll just do a, an Economy Act agreement and go and, go and get it that way. Or, or maybe a direct, right? Uh, you know, based on it's a patented tech, nobody else has it, and it's, it's just the whiz bang uh, that we need. Uh, and so we'll work with our procurement shop to figure out what the best path, best path is that um, doesn't violate the FAR, uh, and, you know, competition and, uh, and contracting acts or anything of that nature. And so, so we're always looking at. If I may, options. CBP over the last few years has has been given uh, a lot of. Uh, sophisticated uh, procurement authorities that you all are are, uh, are are really starting to pull those levers. One last question before we get the hook. Top lesson learned from both of you so far as you're looking to deploy these capabilities. Something that the audience ought to be thinking about. We're all going to start with you. Top lesson learned that you're uh, that you'd like to impart some wisdom. And maybe the, there's an ask out there. <laughs> I think the lesson is for me and our team is to continue to dialogue with industry. Um, I don't think we can do it without you. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, folks who uh, may shy away from wanting to have conversations with you, but I think we enjoy sort of the uh, an open relationship with industry as much as we as much as we can. Uh, and so I think just keep continue to work with us. Uh, we're maturing as an organization. Uh, we want to take the you know advantage of the things that you have to offer. I would just say, we will never outsource our intent. Right. So just bear with us as we try to craft that. And I feel like uh, we owe you a little bit more information about what our intent is. And so to wrap it up is, you know, we're trying to work on sort of a roadmap that we can share with industry that says, here's here's where we're headed as as an organization in terms of technologies and the things that we're interested in that you can you can use as a way to map uh, where, where you want to go uh, in terms of supporting our mission. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Rob. Top lesson learned out of GDIT as you're looking at, you know, technology convergence, technology innovation. Sure. I think the, the biggest lesson learned for us is to always make sure we're listening to our customers about their greatest challenges. You know, we've clearly heard from, uh, from uh, Chief Ortiz and others that, uh, you know, he, he needs more agents in the field. So any solution we deliver has to make sure that we're, we're keeping those agents in the field focused on their mission and enabling the mission, not requiring more time and effort to maintain those solutions. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, uh, to reiterate. Same question. Yeah, what Rob said, um, you know, uh, having been a customer, listen to the customer, listen to the customer, listen to the customer. I think the one thing I've realized uh, coming to this side of the fence is that um, everyone is is doing this. It's they're they're generating much more data in the commercial sector and the state, local, um, private sector. So, how do we leverage that to support missions like CBP and things like federated learning and analytics anywhere? Uh, and so, I think that's you know we didn't get to talk about some of those things, but I think being able to absorb and ingest and leverage that data. Uh, so thinking a little bit bigger picture than just uh, the, the federal sphere and where we can get help um, is my big takeaway. Amen. Jeremy, take us home. Will do, sir. Um, so so I, I, I did a talk not too long ago, and, and it had a slide about building a culture of innovation as the innovation guy. Like, this is, this is what I have to go out with, right? So there's, there's a few. <laughs> A few bullets here that I that I would that I would just stomp on. And this is really this is really like inwardly looking for for us, but maybe also kind of informative for for industry. Um, but but when I when I speak to people about innovation, there's there's a you know short list of things that, that I like to that I like to harp on. First and foremost is executive advocacy and support. Um, so if you have some folks that, that work for you that are that you're that you're empowering to do innovation work, you absolutely have to you you have to have to give them the top cover. They have to have it right. Um, and, and goes that goes part and parcel with in, empowering people. So if you if you want some people, you know, on on your team or in your agency to, to do things innovative, um, you need to empower and, and support them. Again, those two go hand in hand. Um, and then a, a couple others. 
Um, I think you probably heard me say it a couple times, but engaging the field, engaging the end users, that's an absolute must. Um, you can't, I, I, guess, I suppose you could innovate in a vacuum, but I wouldn't recommend it. You know, the, the things that we've done well, that worked out well, it, it involved the field, it involved end users. Um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I have a bullet here. This is really more inwardly forcing, but it says fight, fight red tape, right? Um, so my, my team is constantly, you know, fighting against bureaucratic inertia. Um, and the message for my team is, you know, we, we do that with the utmost professionalism, humility, and honesty. Um, and that includes, you know, working with, with industry as well. But that's, that's a big deal. And then I'll, I'll end on this one point. I don't think we really spoke about this yet. But this is a key piece of innovation. And this is, this is really, um, this, I've added this to my messaging in lots of different um, venues. But the concept of risk acceptance and noble failure is huge, right? So I would never advocate to, to anyone that, it, that it's okay to fail your, your, your core mission. But in the terms of innovation itself, it's okay to fail. In fact, if you're not failing enough, you're probably not being innovative. Um, so I asked, a, I asked a VC that I respect re recently, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave with this, but um, I asked him, like, when, when you look at your portfolio, like, what is, what is the calculus that, they go, that, that goes through your head there? Because, you know, coming from the government, I think we tend to look at things through a, a budgetary lens, and looking at, looking at things through an investment lens is a completely different thing. So he told me, of, the, of all the horses that I bet on, right, all the, all the things that I choose to invest in, as many as half of them are going to fail. But 10% of them make 80% of my money. And so, you know, it, it, it occurred to me that, you know, over the four or five years that we've been doing innovation work, that, that, that's about right. You know, once a year we would do a thing that would, that would have, you know, meaningful and, and more lasting operational impact. And I, I, just, I just found that really, really compelling. So, um, you know, allow your people to fail. It's, it's okay. If, if you truly want to innovate, you, you have to. Um, I'll end with that. Well, I'm going to end with uh, I want to thank all of you and have a happy holiday. And um, uh, two things. One, thank you all for fighting the good fight. And lastly, I can't resist. Uh, if you have not tried federal service, I urge you to consider it. <laughs> you heard the chief talk about he needs seven, several thousand people standing there out there on the X fighting the fight in the field. Uh, they also need really good people uh, in these programs to make sure those operators get everything they need. So I would urge every one of you to take the time over the holidays to really strongly consider that. You will never regret doing that. All right. With that, thank you. Thank you.